my name is Richard Kersley. I'm the head of the uh, global research product uh, at Credit Suisse in the securities uh, division uh, of the firm. And I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to uh, this morning, uh, the launch uh, of the 14th edition uh, of the Credit Suisse Global Investment Returns uh, Yearbook, uh, a piece of research that um, we're extraordinarily proud of at Credit Suisse. Uh, and indeed the association, of course, it has with the London Business School. Uh, and indeed, uh, delighted again to introduce uh, this morning to you, um, uh, long-term collaborators, uh, indeed uh, lead authors uh, of the uh, of the publication, uh, Professors uh, Paul Marsh, Elroy Dimson, and Dr. Uh, Mike Staunton. Uh, again, we'll be uh, running through with you uh, a short presentation, 40 minutes or so, uh, between Paul uh, and Elroy of the key findings uh, of this year's edition. And I think most people will probably agree in uh, the very difficult times that we're seeing at the moment, uh, historical perspective, uh, in which uh, the yearbook provides is a great resource for us to for us to draw off from context in which to to put uh, current developments. Um, I'll pass over now uh, to uh, Paul uh, and and uh, and Elroy. Um, I just just to repeat, we'll we'll have a, a presentation and then have time for for Q and A uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the session. Paul, over to you, sir. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, let me just uh, share my screen and um, then we can move on to the presentation. Right. Uh, good morning, everyone, again. Um, until 2021, uh, we had experienced two decades of low inflation, falling interest rates and easy money. But especially since the start of this year, uh, the winds of change have certainly been blowing. They've been gusting even. Inflation is rising. Monetary policy is tightening. Uh, we're heading into a major uh, interest rate hiking cycle and we're facing significant geopolitical risks. The Credit Suisse Global Investment Returns Yearbook documents and analyzes investment returns since 1900. Over the last 122 years, we've seen many periods of rising inflation, uh, rising interest rates, and we've seen some very extreme geopolitical unrest. We've seen two world wars, for example. The purpose of the yearbook is to use this long period of financial history, where in a sense, we've already seen it all, to shed light on today's investment issues. Today, we're going to be covering uh, three topics. First of all, the yearbook database, and I'm going to summarize what historical returns have been. Secondly, we're going to talk about a major concern to investors today, which is inflation, and the cure for inflation, which is uh, the forthcoming interest rate hikes, which we're likely to see. And then I'm going to swap over to Elroy, who's going to talk about this year's special topic, which is diversification. The database that underlies the yearbook covers stocks, bonds, bills, inflation, and currencies, and GDP since 1900, over the last 122 years. We cover 35 yearbook markets. Those are the ones shown in deep blue here in the chart. 23 of those start in 1900, so we have a full 122 year history. There have been 12 new countries that we brought in in the last two years. We've been very busy. Those are the ones that have a little glow around them on the map. And you can see that we've greatly enhanced our Latin American coverage and our Asia coverage. And we've also added in Greece. We have uh, coverage, partial coverage of 55 other equity markets in the world. Those are the ones shown in light blue. And in fact, the only part of the world that we don't cover um, is the part of the world that is shown in brown here. We have 90 countries in total in our world equity index. We have five composite indexes, a world index, world excluding the United States, a Europe index, and a developed markets and emerging markets index. This is the evolution of equity markets since 1900. 
back in 1900, Great Britain was the world's largest equity market with 24% of the uh, world market capitalization. This chart shows the investable universe for a global investor, and it's in since 2000 free float terms. And the most striking thing you can see about this chart is the dominance of the United States. Uh, the United States uh, very quickly overtook the United Kingdom and by the end of 2021 represented a 60% weighting in the world index uh, based on global um, investable universe. The dominance of the USA means that it's dangerous to extrapolate from US returns. But when we started this project back in 1999, all we knew about global returns was from the United States. And our concern was that this painted too rosy a picture because the US had been such a successful economy and such a successful market. That's why we focus on global returns. What about the performance of markets over time? This chart shows annualized real returns on asset classes, so it's after adjusting for inflation, and it's shown in common currency terms. Uh, we use the US dollar here, uh, but in fact the rankings of markets and the overall picture of what I'm showing here would be identical if we showed this in yen or Swiss francs or British pounds. These are real equity returns, and you can see that for every country for which we have uh, a continuous history since 1900, uh, equity returns have been positive, real equity returns have been positive. Because everything comes above the zero line here, uh, Austria just made it, you can see on the far left, uh, because everything is above the zero line, that means that equities beat inflation everywhere in the world. What we're showing here is the uh, 21 countries with a continuous history and the five composite indexes. We show bond returns. The most striking thing here is that bond returns were not positive in real returns everywhere. There were uh, five countries where uh, real bond returns were actually negative, uh, but equities beat not only inflation, but they beat bonds everywhere. And here I'm showing bill returns. And again, the picture is the same. Equities beat inflation everywhere. They beat bonds everywhere. They beat bills everywhere. Bonds beat bills everywhere except Portugal. And so over the long run, the law of risk and return held the riskiest securities, equities, did better than bonds, which are, uh, these are long sovereign bonds. Uh, so these are not risk-free assets um, and they are intermediate risk assets. And the safest assets, bills, gave the lowest return. So the law of risk and return is very clear. Also, uh, look at the returns from the United States. The United States had the best performing equity market. Again, another reason for caution about extrapolating US returns. The rest of the world, the world ex the United States, gave an annualized return of 4.5%, significantly lower than in the United States. Obviously, some countries in this chart have been unlucky those on the left-hand side, uh, particularly those are countries that were most impacted by the world wars. And the uh, countries on the right have been the lucky countries. What we're going to focus on is the return that a global investor would have obtained, and that's the return on the world index. That's if you held a diversified portfolio of the world over the last 122 years, the equity return there was 5.3% in real terms. That is 4.6% more than the return on bills. So that's the historical equity risk premium, the amount by which equities beat cash, and the amount by which equities beat world bonds was 3.2%. So investors historically have enjoyed a very handsome equity risk premium relative to bills. Prospectively, we expect the risk premium in the future to be lower, not a lot lower, but around three and a half percent. 
If you're interested in the reasons for that, uh, the yearbook goes into a lot of detail on why we're expecting a somewhat lower risk premium in the future. What about prospective returns? The first thing to say about prospective returns is that you can think of returns as the real interest rate plus a premium for risk. That applies to any asset class you like to mention. So the first thing we need to look at is where real interest rates are and what they've been doing. And you can see in this chart, which shows the real yields on 10-year index-linked bonds, that real interest rates over the last uh, 22 years have fallen from an average of just below 4%, the dark black line here shows the average of these countries, to at the end of 2021, the very beginning of 2022, a minus 1.5% real return on index-linked bonds. That has been enormously useful for asset returns because asset returns are the discounted value of future cash flows. And if the discount rate, the real rate of interest is part of that, has fallen significantly, that tends to boost asset values very strongly. Unfortunately, this has a very nasty reverse gear. When real interest rates start to rise again, as they have in 2022, uh, that does not help asset values. It does just the opposite. Nevertheless, uh, the real uh, interest rate still remains, you know, seven weeks later than this chart goes up to, uh, very low at around about minus 1%. What happens after low real interest rates and high real interest rates? This chart shows what happens when we look at every country year of real interest rates we have in our database. And that comes to something like 2,500 country years. And on the left of this chart, we're showing low real interest rates. And on the right, we're showing high real interest rates. And now we're going to look at what happens to asset returns over the following five years. This is what happens to bonds over the next five years. And bond returns after low initial real interest rates are low. And real bond returns after, low re after high real initial um, real interest rates are high. So the asset returns very much are based on what the real interest rate is at the start of the period. This is the picture for equities. It's very, very similar. If you start from a low real interest rate, you expect low subsequent returns. And if you start from a high real interest rate, you expect high subsequent real returns, whether you're looking at bonds or equities. And real interest rates therefore provide the baseline for all risky assets. So when we're thinking about what future returns might be, we need to think about what the real interest rate is today. This is the historical return experience since 1950. And we've divided it up broadly into generations. So on the left, you can see the return that baby boomers have achieved uh, since 1950. And then we have the World uh, Index uh, since 1970, and then we have the World Index since 1990, as it might apply to millennials. We show real equity returns, the annualized real equity return, the annualized real bond return, and the return on a 70-30 blend, 70% equities, 30% bonds. And you can see that these three generations, uh, the baby boomers, Generation X and millennials, have all enjoyed very high real returns, investment returns that we would be delighted to have obtained. And you can see that on the 70-30 blend, it's really not much different between those three generations. What about prospective returns? Much lower. On bonds, we've started by assuming that the real rate of return on bonds will be roughly what you would get on 30-year US uh, index linked or tips at the moment. And um, 
that is, I'm afraid, uh, just 10 basis points, 0.1%. If you add to that the 3.5% equity risk premium, you get an expected return on equities of 3.6%. The blend, 70-30 blend, would have an expected return of 2.6%. That's less than half what past generations have achieved. And uh, that um, indicates that although real rates have gone up somewhat in 2022, it's still a low expected return world. And that has big implications for pensions, for saving, uh, for all sorts of things. And, um, you know, even at uh, 3.6%, of course, that would still be a very healthy return on equities. We've just been spoiled by the past. Let me move on to inflation and interest rate hikes. And let's see what history can tell us about that. This is the average inflation rate across countries that have got continuous history since 1900. And you can see the in 1921 to 23, we've had to exclude Germany and Austria. That's because German inflation in 1923 was 209 billion percent. So that would simply uh, mess up the chart and go off the scale. So we've excluded the hyperinflationary years. Broadly speaking, you can see that the two world wars uh, were not good for inflation. You can also see that inflation peaked in the mid 70s and then it steadily declined. And it declined because um, monetary policy helped a lot in bringing down inflation. And by the time we got to the end of 2020, in the yearbook, we were reporting the lowest average inflation rate since 1934. That all changed. By the end of 2021, it had risen tenfold from 0.42% to 4.4%. Inflation was back. In the US, it's currently around 7.5%, a 40-year high. In the UK, 5.5%, a 30-year high. And in Germany, close to 5%, a 40-year high. So inflation is very much a concern for investors right now. How have investors fared when inflation has been low and when inflation has been high? This chart's a bit like the last one I shown you. We're using all of our data. Uh, we're looking at all of the country years of inflation with all of the low inflation country years on the left and the high ones on the right. This is uh, real bond returns in years of uh, low to high inflation. And it's exactly what you'd expect it to be. Bonds do very poorly when inflation is high and bonds do really well in deflationary periods. Uh, that's when bonds really come into their own. They're a hedge against deflation. Now, lots of people believe that equities are a hedge against inflation. Let me show you that that's not true. These are equity returns, and you can see that equities also do badly when inflation is high. And inflation being high here means those two sets of bars on the right, the 1.2 and the minus 10, uh, when inflation uh, is above 7.4%. Uh, it's at those intermediate levels of inflation uh, when stocks do relatively well. So inflation is bad news for equities, just as it's bad news for bonds. Equities are not an inflation hedge. But long run, as we've seen, they've been wonderful inflation beaters. But that's not because they're an inflation hedge. It's because of the equity risk premium. Now let's look at interest rate hikes. Uh, this is the US Federal Reserve official interest rates from 1914 to 2021. This is all the way back to when the Federal Reserve was set up at the end of 1913. And you can see that there are cycles of uh, interest rate hikes, uh, followed by cycles of interest rate falls. If you look at the really big one, the peak there in the middle, where it peaked at 1981, uh, from starting in the mid 70s. You can see we've got little diamonds that show uh, the beginning of uh, a hiking cycle, and then they show uh, the end of the hiking cycle and the beginning of the 
uh, interest rate falling cycle, um, you can see that the actual pattern of moves was a bit jagged. By the time you got to 1980, interest rates were being cut again. And you would have thought that the hiking cycle was all over. But then uh, they went up again from 10 to 14% uh, in a couple more moves. And so in real time, uh, what you see visually here, shown by the diamonds, is not something you could actually have invested on. The diamonds involve hindsight. We've just fitted them because we know with hindsight that they went back up again in 1980 uh, and peaked at 14%. So what we do to compare returns during hiking cycles and in easing cycles is we have a rule that you could have followed in real time. Rate hiking investing is where you invest on the first time rates are hiked and you hold until the first cut. And rate fall investing is when you invest on the first cut and you hold until the first hike subsequently. So we're going to compare the performance of assets during rate hiking cycles and rate falling cycles. And the reason this is important is because we're about to go into a rate hiking cycle in the United States and the Federal Reserve, what the Fed does affects the world. In the UK, we're already in a hiking cycle. We've already had two interest rate hikes. Why do central banks hike interest rates? They hike them because they want to cure inflation. They want to choke off demand. And uh, they do that by increasing the price of credit, mortgages, borrowing, credit cards, everything else. Uh, they hope that they will damp down demand and that will damp down inflationary pressures, bring inflation back under control. So what happens during hiking and uh, interest rate uh, falls? This is the United States, first of all, and this is real equity returns. And first of all, this is after interest rate falls. So this is during the easy money periods. And you can see that the real rate of return on US equities has been 9.7%. After rate rises, just 3%. This is real bond returns after interest rate falls, 3.7, and during the hiking cycles, fairly positive at 0.2. Not much difference in bill returns, and inflation is higher in the hiking cycles than during the easing cycles. And that makes sense because the reason you have a hiking cycle is to choke off inflation, but it takes time. It takes a series of interest rate rises before you choke off inflation. And so you see the higher inflation rates in those uh, hiking cycles. Here's the UK. Uh, this is from 1930. Uh, we're looking here at Bank of England base rate changes and real equity returns were 8.5% during uh, after interest rate falls and falling interest rate periods. They were 1.2, just 1.2, uh, after rate rises or in interest rate hiking periods. Uh, similarly, bond returns were higher in uh, falling interest rate periods than rising interest rate periods. Um, bills uh, different in the UK, they were higher after interest rate rises and the inflation picture is similar to the United States. So there are big negative differences between rising and falling interest rate periods. If we look at uh, premiums, uh, we're looking at the same data now, we were just expressing it as uh, relative terms. So this is equities versus bills. And you can see that in the United States, the equity risk premium was massive in the falling interest rate periods and modest in the rising interest rate periods. Uh, similarly, equities versus bonds and bonds versus bills uh, during the falling interest rate periods, uh, bonds showed a very large premium over bills. But when interest rates were rising in the hiking cycles, it would have been better to have been out of bonds and simply in cash. Here's the UK. Um, the, all of the equity premium for the UK, whether against bills or bonds, occurred during the falling interest rate periods. And uh, so the entire long run UK 
equity risk premium was earned during easing cycles. Was this about risk? Is it that risk is higher um, in falling interest rate periods? Um, yes, a little bit in the United States, not much in the UK, not much in it when it comes to bonds. Uh, but if we look at sharp ratios, which show the return, the reward for risk ratios, you can see that those sharp ratios were very, very much higher uh, during uh, the uh, falling interest rate periods than after interest rate rises. So this is sobering stuff, uh, given uh, where we are in terms of inflation uh, feeling out of control and the cure for inflation uh, seemingly quite painful in terms of its impact on asset returns. Um, should we be deeply pessimistic about this? Uh, well, uh, this has been long signaled. Uh, we've already seen a lot of movement in markets in the early part of 2022, anticipating what's going to happen. Whether it's fully anticipated, uh, who knows? Uh, but certainly a lot should already be priced in. Secondly, what I've shown you here is long run averages and they conceal very big differences between different hiking and easing cycles. Uh, but nevertheless, I think the uh, message of history is that hiking cycles have never been very good news or seldom been very good news uh, for asset prices generally. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Elroy to talk about diversification. Well, hello everyone. And uh, it's uh, good to be with you and to share some of our thoughts on, on this uh, unwanted, exciting period in financial markets. So what I'd like to do is to uh, uh, look with you at uh, something which uh, history has to share on a key issue, uh, which is the issue of uh, uh, diversification. And we'll just have a look at uh, the uh, slides, which I hope to get up there. And I hope you can see this slide deck uh, showing the third topic that we're going to talk about, which is uh, diversification. Elroy, we can't see your slides yet. Okay, we'll do one more shot. So are we okay on slides? Yep, we can see them now. Thank you. The um, topic of diversification is one of the oldest ones for those who, uh, like Paul, Mike, uh, and I, uh, have talked about when we're teaching investments, um, but it's also increasingly important. What I would like to do is, first of all, start with the, the old story. The, the old story that we used to teach was that uh, diversification provides big benefits, but you don't need to do an awful lot to get those benefits. So uh, from the earliest stages of our career, we would uh, put up on the screen, or should I say the blackboard, a diagram that looks like this, where we would plot uh, in the uh, uh, top left of a chart showing standard deviation of returns, what the standard deviation has been for a one stock portfolio. And we would then look at multiple uh, um, stocks in the portfolio. What you can see here uh, is how standard deviation for a portfolio in this particular case, it's a random selection from the New York Stock Exchange uh, over the last decade. Uh, what happens to the standard deviation? The story is that risk goes down rapidly, but there is an irreducible minimum, and that is the fundamental risk of exposure to the uh, fluctuations in the market, in the stock exchange in this particular case. Um, but it's not quite as simple as that, and we should look at this a little bit before thinking about uh, global diversification. Because you do need more than 10 or 20 stocks to be well diversified, and diversification then becomes something which is important. You can see here, what the tracking error is, the extent to which a particular portfolio deviates 
from the market benchmark. And so you can see we start out with a very large shackling error. Uh, and that's on the top left of this chart. And as we increase the number of stocks, then we end up with lower levels uh, of risk and lower levels of tracking error. But tracking error is still substantial. And so you can see with the 10 or 20 stocks, you would end up with a tracking error, which for most portfolios today would be regarded as inappropriate, or at least for an institutional portfolio. Um, and so 11 or 8% uh, percent of the tracking error. If you have 50 stocks, which you might think of would be quite uh, large, and perhaps unacceptably large to some individual investors, you still have a large tracking error. Uh, and if you had 100 New York Stock Exchange stocks, the tracking error um, is a uh, large 3.3%. What does that mean? Well, suppose the expected return on the market is 5%, then in two years out of three, you'd get 5% plus or minus 3.3, uh, and so uh, you may, with quite a large probability, end up with a return which is less than 1.7 or greater than 8.3, uh, even though you think you've got 100 stocks in your portfolio and have secured safety by doing that. So we should roll to, to uh, the insights that Bruno Solnick, who was then a young professor in France who had uh, gone to Stanford for his PhD, who wrote a, a provocative article uh, called uh, Why Not Diversify Internationally? Uh, he looked at individual stocks in uh, eight markets, uh, and he claimed on the basis of his research that American investors could halve their risk if they diversified internationally. Um, and that idea seemed, as he saw it, exotic at best, or by many of his readers, uh, irrational. It's now, of course, part of the way we uh, think about investing. So his advice was heeded. Um, and uh, he had written about this in the uh, mid 1970s. By 1980, US investors had only still 1% of their assets uh, out of the country. Today it's 20%. US pension funds had 0% out of the country. Uh, and uh, today uh, it's 38%. So, uh, it, it wasn't just an article by Solnik, of course. Investing abroad became easier and cheaper, and you could get a low-cost fund that would do the job for you. This very influential article uh, and the wave of interest in diversifying internationally is something which should have offered benefits, but we should look first at what investors in the biggest markets, that's the US, uh, experienced. And so here you can see a move away from diversifying across stocks towards our focus on diversifying across countries. In the modern world, we can buy exposure to complete countries uh, through uh, simple structures such as index funds. And so here we're looking at what would happen if you bought one country or two or three or five or 10 or 20 countries to go into your portfolio. Uh, and you can see here, uh, what would the experience be if you were looking at the 21 DMS, Dimson, Marsh, Staunton countries? Those are the ones with a complete history from 1900 uh, to this year. And so this first line shows you what would happen if you put a one country portfolio together, two, three, four, five country portfolio and so forth. And it's showing you what the average results would be. And so instead of typically having almost 30% as the risk for a one country portfolio, uh, you could get it down to 18.6. Uh, That's a 37% cut in risk, by the way. These are equally weighted portfolios. Um, we can look at the same story um, on a capitalization weighted basis. Uh, obviously, if there's only one market, we start at the same 29.3 because we've got an observation for each country. Uh, but um, once we have multiple countries in there, we can get down a little bit lower. There's a 41% cut in risk for the average investor. But the average investor is in a relatively small country compared to the wealth of US investors and US portfolios. So if we were in the US, our starting point would be lower because the US is a lower risk country. So the US over our full history 
would have given you a 19.8% standard deviation. And so this light blue line you've got here looks at what happens if you started with one country, the US, and then you put in the next largest country and the next largest and the next largest until you add the smallest country. And so you can see you end up on, on the same basis with 17.3% as the standard deviation. It's still a worthwhile cut, it's a 13% cut in risk. Um, that's the uh, uh, very valuable risk reduction. It's less than Solnik believes, but uh, it's still substantial and worth, worth having. So we've looked more at global diversification, exploiting our database. We've looked starting in 1974, when the famous uh, article on diversifying internationally was published. We've looked at the present time, we've looked at various sub periods, uh, and we will also look at the entire 122 years in our sample. So uh, we're looking here globally. Um, and the first thing that we can look at uh, is uh, what uh, the position would be for a domestic investor uh, and what their sharp ratio, their award to risk ratio would be if since 1974, uh, they had invested globally. Um, and you can see here that the global investor uh, would not have had a higher return, would have had a lower return. Um, uh, and uh, the experience therefore of the American that stayed at home for investing was actually rather better. Why was it better? Um, well, the United States had good performance uh, and relatively low risk. And so going overseas for the US investor, it so happened, we see with hindsight, um, was not financially beneficial in the way that Solnit had visualized. Here you can see some sub periods, you can see 1980 to, 19, uh, to 2021, same story. You can look at the most recent period from 1990 onwards or from 2000 onwards. Uh, going global, didn't really help. Uh, the reason being that US returns were exceptionally high. If we go all the way back to uh, looking at our entire data set uh, and finding through uh, the period from 1974 to date, uh, what would happen? Then you can see uh, if you had hedged, you might have reduced risk a little bit. But when you buy an overseas portfolio, you're buying some assets and you have some currency exposure. And hedging currency didn't do a great deal to help. In fact, uh, this century, uh, it's not helped at all. If we go all the way back to 1900, it's a somewhat different story. Uh, and then uh, hedging by means of uh, uh, looking at, at the uh, impact of uh, long short positions in uh, uh, assets that give us pure currency exposure, uh, hedging actually would have been worthwhile. So, Solnick's advice didn't pay off, and the reason is that the US did exceptionally well, uh, and US risk was relatively low. So let's look a little bit uh, further. Uh, let's first of all look at what happens if you uh, invest uh, domestically or globally in other markets. We've got 32 markets with data that begins in 1974, and you can see in the main that the investors from most other countries gained. So the increase in the sharp ratio, which is the height of these bars, is positive in most countries. So it's been worthwhile for all countries, um, to, with the ex exclusion of a handful of smaller ones and one big one, that's the United States. So success in financial terms isn't guaranteed. Uh, it's a good decision to invest globally. Uh, Americans did it, but the outcome didn't really help them financially. Um, it's particularly helpful if you are an investor based in a market where assets are concentrated in a particular field. It's a topic we've written about in the past, uh, and some national markets rely on a very small number of industries. To some extent, benefits of diversifying internationally have changed over time, and we can see here from our earliest data what the correlations were between performance in different countries. Uh, on the left of each of these families of bars, you can see the US compared to the UK. They were uh, countries that started out with a quite low correlation. You can see beside that, the next green bar is the US compared to Germany. Um, and if you start averaging these, uh, in the uh, 1800s, there was low correlation between markets on average. You can see that continues 
uh, uh, in, uh, in the last century, in the 20th century. Uh, but by the time you reach recent times, 1972 to 2000, 2001 to 2002, you can see that on average, the correlation between countries was getting up. So there were high correlations, particularly once the gold standard disappeared and after the Bretton Woods Agreement and as globalization increased in general. Um, let's have a look then at what the correlations are between markets. And you can see here uh, a bar chart that shows you what the correlations look like uh, if you uh, compare different uh, markets uh, over particular five-year periods. The last one is a six-year period because we've just added on 2021. 20, and so uh, on the left, you can see that uh, based on MSCI data beginning uh, in 1970, the correlations were uh, lowish, 0.37, um, between De uh, developed markets averaging all possible pairs uh, and on the light blue you can see almost zero if we were doing the same exercise uh, with correlations between emerging markets as time has gone by correlations have risen and markets have moved together more closely so that if we look at the five-year intervals ending in 05 2010 2015 2020 2021 actually uh, you can see correlations were quite high um, but they're not one in any sense. And you see correlations between emerging markets also rising. The world is more global. So those correlations have risen, but there's still potential gains from diversification. And that diversification internationally is more attainable than uh, it was when we go back to uh, earlier periods in history. If we look at the uh, correlation, not between uh, the stocks in markets, but between the broad category of uh, emerging markets and developed markets, you see a similar sort of trend. What you see is that if we look at the correlation between uh, emerging markets as a whole and developed markets as a whole, uh, that was very low. If you look on the left-hand side of this chart, uh, again, using MSCI data, uh, and on the right-hand side, you can see that they've risen substantially, the world as a whole. Uh, is moving in unison. Again, still less than one, so less than a perfect correlation. And the correlation between emerging market indexes and developed markets indexes had also risen. So investors from emerging markets still have uh, a lot to gain from global diversification. Um, for investors from developed markets, uh, having some exposure to emerging markets also improves diversification possibilities. What do these correlations look like over time? Here we've done all the way back to 1900 and we've looked at the stock bond correlation with uh, higher frequency data from 1900 to the beginning of the current year. And you can see here that uh, we've got a period on the left of this chart in which stocks and bonds tended to move together, although not always in the middle, you see an exception. And then if you move out of the 20th century into the 21st century, you can see that although they had been positive on average over the long term, uh, correlations between stock and bond performance had flipped to being negative. Let's take this little bit on the right, beginning uh, in the year 2000, uh, and focus on that. We'll actually go all the way back to, um, to, uh, um, uh, to uh, round up the end the years 1990 to 2000 and look at the flip. But the story for the US and the UK has been similar. Let's have a look now at what happens if you begin uh, at the end of the 1990s and move over to uh, the year 2000 onwards. And at that point, what you see is that the global average, averaging all possible pairs of countries, um, had uh, switched from there being positive correlation between stock and bond performance to a negative correlation. Um, so the flip happens in 2000, but we're using a rolling five years. So by the time we see a zero on these charts, that's using the previous five years. So this is something which is happening in the late 1990s. The uh, chart shows you major uh, uh, three, three categories. 
of the markets here. So you can see the United States has a negative correlation, which is quite marked, minus 0.27. You can see the uh, equally weighted uh, average of all the countries in our database, which is plus 0.05, more or less to zero, uh, as of the most recent period. And you can see if you look at large countries, uh, something in between the two, uh, in between countries in our database as a whole uh, and the United States. So let's um, look uh, at what has happened as we've entered into a period of low inflation, and falling nominal and real interest rates and, and, and easy money as we've, uh, uh, as we've moved beyond that. So here you can see the different sub-periods. We've got the, here the stock bond correlations for different countries. On average, it's been 0.45 since 1900. Uh, looking at, first of all at uh, the data up to 1949. Secondly, looking at the 1900s from 1950 to the end of the last century to 1999, you can see it was similar. And if we look at the uh, uh, period which runs through what we've had so far of this century, you can see that on average, the correlation has flipped to being negative. And so what we saw previously has been a, a pattern which represents change this century compared to the previous century and is quite marked. So um, let, me, uh, um, let me look at the average correlation between equity markets now, and you'll see here one key thing which people talk about a lot. Does diversification let you down in crises when you, when you need it most? Uh, is it the case that when we have a crisis we've marked here in red, what happens? Um, and uh, actually during turmoil periods, we do see that correlations rise. Uh, that means that the benefits from diversification are somewhat more muted. Uh, and you can see here, based on uh, the 52 countries from SCI that we've got as uh, substantial uh, data in our substantial data set, you can see that short term, when there is some turmoil, uh, there's a rise, and then there's reversion towards the mean, relatively little impact for long run investors. And we uh, see that the flight to safety makes bonds a uh, suitable hedge. The book that we've uh, prepared, the yearbook, tells a, a, a detailed story and there's uh, lots to look at there. But we do, uh, out of this book, select some for the uh, summary edition. And the summary edition is uh, available, in fact, on, on the web quite freely. What's the big lesson? Uh, well, we think financial history can inform future st strategy. There's the famous quote from Churchill, the longer you can look back, the farther you can look forward. Our special topic this year has been diversification. We still regard diversification as the premier free lunch in the words of Harry Markowitz, the Nobel laureate. The investors can either get the same return at lower risk by reducing their risk, or they can take uh, a higher return in terms of what they'd expect to receive to the same level of risk as they had been accustomed to. So uh, how do you contact us? Uh, here are the contact details for Imran, for uh, our press officer at London Business School, and for ourselves. Um, I will leave that on the screen and we'll flow through to the uh, small print which you'll see here, which we have to show you. And um, if you can read fast, you'll have absorbed a lot of important information there. And at that point, we can stop the share and, uh, and go back to Open Exchange for hosting this meeting. I think Richard will now share his thoughts. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, as I say, we're, we're just just a smidgen over the uh, the, the the ten o'clock mark. Um, but thanks uh, to Paul. Thanks uh, to El Roy. Indeed to, to Mike as well. With the again invaluable uh, contributions uh, collectively to to what is a piece of work that uh, say as I said at the outset at Credit Suisse is extraordinarily uh, proud to to present to you. Um, in terms of follow ups, uh, a, a slide indeed that uh, El Roy had uh, the pro close of the presentation. It uh, gives you the contact details to, to reach out to should you, uh, again, have access to, to the material, uh, the reports and so forth. So please do follow up uh, on that basis.
uh, alternatively, uh, as they drop, uh, feel free to drop me an, uh, an email as well. But uh, I'll conclude uh, proceedings and, and thank you again for uh, very much for attending. Thank you.